fourth graders. My name is Miss Mayani and I teach fourth grade at Olympic View Elementary. One of the many things that I miss about being in my classroom is getting to share and read stories with my students. So I'm really looking forward and excited about reading with you today. Um, another thing that I do with my students each day is we always start the day by greeting each other in another language. So that's why I said hello in Spanish. Um, tomorrow I'll greet you in another language so you can look forward to that. Today we're going to be reading a story and I'm going to be asking you questions. So I want you to be responding to those questions and here are a couple possible ways that you can do that. You can write things down, you can um, write it in a notebook or on a piece of paper or you could type it on a computer. You can um, find somebody who's nearby, maybe you have a grandparent or a sibling who you can discuss this with. You can use an imaginary conversation partner or maybe you have a great stuffy, you can be a good listener nearby. Um, whatever works best for you is fine. You can um, speak in another language when you're discussing these questions, um, whatever you're most comfortable with so that you can be practicing your reading comprehension skills. This week we're going to be practicing supporting our opinions with reasons and evidence. We've been practicing that all year when I ask you questions like, why do you think so? Or what in the text makes you think that? Now I'm going to be asking my fourth graders to be providing that information without me prompting them. So you're going to be using a speaking frame and um, when you're discussing the questions, I want you to use this speaking frame. The reason I think this is, and then you will complete the sentence with your reasons and evidence from the story. Today we're going to be reading the story Flight, The Journey of Charles Lindbergh. It is written by Robert Burley, illustrated by Mike Wimmer, and published by Developmental Studies Center. Um, the story of flight is about Charles Lindbergh and his um, historic flight from New York to Paris in 1927. Um, this, uh, he was the first person to fly solo or by himself across the Atlantic Ocean. And in 1927, this is a big deal because um, air tra uh, airplanes and aircrafts are not very common. The Wright brothers only recently invented their airplane and their first flight of a motorized aircraft was only in 1907. Um, so this was only 20 years after that. Um, during this time, it wasn't common to see planes flying overhead. Um, and his historic journey changed the way that people looked at air travel for the future. In the last unit, fourth graders were practicing using inferences from clues that in the text that help you better understand what the author means. Um, I'm going to be encouraging my fourth graders to continue practicing using inferences as we read the story today. I'll also be defining and explaining key vocabulary. Um, so you might notice me stopping and giving a definition and then rereading the sentence to help you better understand the text. All right, flight. Journey of Charles Lindbergh. It is 1927 and his name is Charles Lindbergh. Later they will call him the Lone Eagle. Later they will call him Lucky Lindy. But not now. Now it is May 20th, 1927 and he is standing in the still dark dawn. He watches rain drizzle down on the airfield and on his small airplane. The airplane has a name painted on its side, Spirit of St. Louis. Who is telling this story and what in the text makes you think that? Well, Peggy, I think that it is an outside person telling the story, not Charles, because it says later they will call him the lone eagle. And I know when um, authors use pronouns like they and him, that it's usually a third person narrator. So I think that this is from a third person point of view. Lindbergh is nearly as tall as the plane itself. And yet he is about to attempt what no one has done before, to fly without a stop from New York to Paris, France, over 3,600 miles away across the Atlantic Ocean, alone. He climbs into the box-like cockpit. A cockpit is that small area at the front of the plane where the pilots sit. He climbs into the box-like cockpit that will be his only home for many, many hours. He clicks on the engine. He listens as it catches, gurgles, and roars. A few friends are here to say goodbye. 
They are only a few feet away, and yet to Lindbergh how far off they seem. They look up at him and wave, good luck, keep safe. A telephone wire stretches across the far end of the field. To touch this fire will plunge the plane to the ground. There is an extra fuel tank in front of the cockpit. Because of this, Lindbergh cannot see straight ahead. Will the spirit of St. Louis with its over 5,000 pounds rise up in the air? To keep the plane lighter, Lindbergh is leaving behind his radio and parachute. Will that be enough? He has been up all night getting ready. A thought runs back and forth through his mind. It is still possible to turn back, to return home. And yet another thought is stronger. I have been waiting my entire life for this flight. Lindbergh lowers his goggles. Goggles are protective eyewear. Lindbergh lowers his goggles and nods his head. Go! Men on each side push to help the plane roll over the soggy ground. The little plane bumps forward, gaining speed. The wheels leave the ground, then touch back. The plane seems to hop, taking its last bow to earth. On the third try, it stays aloft. That means it stays in the air. It soars above the wire by only 20 feet. The spirit of St. Louis rises in the air. It is 7.52 in the morning, New York time. Lindbergh points his plane toward the Atlantic and beyond, toward Paris, over 30 hours away. What did you learn in the part of the story you just heard? Well, Peggy, I heard in this part of the story that Lindbergh's plane almost didn't make it and um, there was a telephone wire and they were worried he was going to catch it, but instead his plane got off the ground and was able to rise above the plane and now he is headed towards Paris, which is 30 hours away. He gazes down in the morning light, how far off Paris seems, across the long ocean. He plans to follow the coastline, flying northeast. The land's edge looks to him like green fingers, pointing at the dark sea. To see ahead, Lindbergh pokes a small homemade periscope. A periscope is like a, um, like a telescope that you can see around corners. Um, they uh, use them in submarines. To see ahead, Lindbergh pokes a small homemade periscope out the side of the cockpit. Sometimes he flies very close to the water, just 10 feet above the waves. He knows that at this low height, the plane glides more smoothly. The plane drones on. It cruises at about 100 miles an hour. At this rate, he will have enough fuel to reach his destination, but only if he stays on course. Beside him in the cockpit is a little book. He keeps a diary. Diary is like a journal or something that you take notes in about your day. He keeps a diary as he goes, all day long, hour by hour. It is as if he were speaking to himself. He wants to remember everything because no one else will ever really know. At 12.08, he flies above Nova Scotia. Just after four, he flies above the coast of Newfoundland. At dusk, he looks down and sees icebergs. In his diary, he calls them white pyramids, white patches on a blackened sea, sentries of the Arctic. A sentry is like a guard. White patches on a blackened sea, sentries of the Arctic. He wonders what lies ahead. The sun sets far behind the plane. Lindbergh flies over St. John's, Newfoundland, the last point of land in North America. Now he can no longer follow the land's edge for direction. He must chart his course carefully. The slightest movement can send him miles off course and risk the fuel supply. He follows two compasses and stars to navigate. A compass is a tool that um, is used to help find directions, so it helps you find northeast, south, west. Um, and so he's using two compasses and the stars to help him find his way. As long as the sky is clear, he is safe, but he must stay awake. He writes, now I must cross not one, but two oceans, one of night and one of water. Time passes slowly. It is almost nine at night, Lindbergh's 13th hour in the air. He has completed one third of the flight. So what's happened in the part of the story you just heard?
while picking in this part of the story, Lindbergh is trying to find his way now that he can't see the land. He's out on the open ocean and he's worried about what's going to happen at night and if he's going to be able to stay up all night. He moves through dense curling fog lit ghostly white by the moon. He suddenly enters a huge storm cloud. The plane shimmers moving up and down in the uniform blackness. He wonders, can I fly above it? Slowly he soars up to 10,500 feet. Here it is clear but very, very cold. He extends his arm outside the cockpit and feels stinging pinpricks. He clicks on his small flashlight and peers out. Heavy ice has formed on the plane's wings. He cannot risk his instruments icing up. He points the spirit of St. Louis back down. The wings quiver as they slice through the turbulent air. Turbulent means like really rough and um, wind is really blowing. The wings quiver as they slice through the turbulent air. The fog continues, but now at least the air is warmer. The ice begins to melt and Lindbergh roars ahead through the fog and clouds to Paris over 2,000 miles away. Space and time and deep, deep darkness. It is the other side of midnight, the loneliest hours. Lindbergh has been awake for almost 50 hours straight. He is closer to Europe than America. Now there is no turning back, only moving forward. He dozes for a minute and then jerks awake. One of the plane's wings is dipping crazily. In a sudden rush of fear, he grabs for the throttle. The throttle is what controls the speed. In a sudden rush of fear, he grabs for the throttle. He gropes for the steady center with his heart pounding. As he feels the leveling wings, he lets out a breath. He repeats over and over to himself, I must not sleep, I must not sleep. Here, high above the churning ocean, to sleep is to die. There are some of the things he does, these are some of the things he does to stay awake. He leans his face near the open window to feel the cold air. He holds his eyelids up with his fingers to keep them from closing. He remembers growing up on a farm in Minnesota. He remembers being a trick pilot and walking out on a plane's wings. He remembers the people in St. Louis who paid for this plane. Sometimes he take a, takes a sip of water from his canteen. He also has five chicken sandwiches with him. That is all the food he has brought. But he eats nothing. It is easier to stay awake on an empty stomach. His body cries for sleep. He loses track of time. The night is endless. He wishes for the sun to rise. Dawn comes slowly, growing out of the gray mist. Will the fog never end, he wonders? The clouds change color from green to gray and from gray to red and gold. Lindbergh has been in the air for 23 hours. He is 2,300 miles from New York and has 1,300 miles to go. He feels completely alone in the world. He feels as if he were flying through all eternity. He tries to stay on a course, but because of his constantly curving route, he is not always sure. Here and there, the clouds seem to break apart. He sees far below him the ocean. From high up, it is like a great blue shaft with gray walls. Then he flies into the clouds again, into the unchanging mist. The day comes on brighter and warmer. Sometimes he imagines he, he sees land. No, it is only the flickering shapes of the clouds and water, 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 endless water. It is 7.30 in the morning in New York and Paris is over a thousand miles away. There's no alternative but death and failure, he writes. Flying closer to the water, Lindbergh sights a porpoise, kind of like a dolphin. Lindbergh sights a porpoise leaping above the waves. He spies a seagull. Then, fishing boats. Something quickens in Lindbergh's blood. He guides the spirit of St. Louis carefully down and down to just above a boat. He throttles the plane and calls out a question. Which way, he shouts, is Ireland? He hopes for a word. He longs for a wave, a warmer welcome back to the fellowship of men. It is 10.52 in the morning, New York time. What happened in part of the story you just heard? Lindbergh sees in the distance low mountains. Now he is awake with new hope. Land is near. He quickly unfolds a map across his knees. He flies over the southern tip of Ireland. He is right on course. Cows graze on green hills. People in horse-drawn horse carts look up and wave. He could land in Ireland, but decides to go on. He wants to complete his dream. It 
It is 1.52 in the afternoon, New York time, as he crosses England. It is Lindbergh's 31st hour in the air. He crosses more water. The wide day is slowly ebbing toward twilight. When he sees land, the coast of France, children run out of their houses and watch him fly by. He continues on. Then Lindbergh spies a glow ahead of him. Paris! I am here, I am here. A great joy wells up inside him. For a moment, he does not want the flight ever to end. Huddled inside his tiny box house, folded in the dense hum of the airplane's engine, he loves this strange closeness to the clouds and sky. It is 4.52 in the afternoon, New York time, Lindbergh's 34th hour in the air. From above, all Lindbergh sees are many, many small lights. But now he must concentrate on just one thing, the sod coming up to meet me. Sod is like grass. The sod coming up to meet me. Closer, closer, closer. The plane touches the ground. It bounces, rolls, hugs the solid earth. It is 1022 Paris time. The flight has taken 33 and a half hours. Thousands of people are running toward the plane. For a moment, Lindbergh is dazed. It seems to him as if he were drowning in a great sea. People surround the plane, cheering, but Lindbergh can hardly hear them. He, his ears seem to have been deafened by the hours of roaring engine. Crowds pull him out of the cockpit. Men and women are calling his name over and over. They carry him on their shoulders. Others begin to tear pieces of the plane. More than anything else, Lindbergh wants to save the spirit of St. Louis. His first words are a question. Are there any mechanics here? But no one speaks English. Finally, two French aviators, uh, an aviator is like an airplane pilot. Finally, two French aviators arrive to help him. Policemen guard the plane. The aviators take Lindbergh, Lindbergh away from the still cheering crowd. In the airfield's hangar, a hangar is like a garage for airplanes. In the airfield's hangar, he tells the story of his flight to the other pilots, the cramped cockpit, the aloneness, the long, long night. Meanwhile, unknown to Lindbergh, newspaper headlines all over the world are beginning to blaze in the news. American hero, safe in Paris. Lindbergh is driven off to the American embassy. His, he answers more questions about his flight. He has not slept in over 60 hours. Finally, at 4.15 in the morning, he goes to bed. When he wakes, his life will be changed forever. When he wakes, there will, be a, there will be huge parades and medals and speeches. He will be the most famous man in the world. It is the year 1927. It is 1927, and his name is Charles Lindbergh. So, let's discuss the story. What is the plot of Flet? If you had to tell what happens in the story in a few sentences, what would you say? Well, Piggy, I would say that the plot of flight is about how Charles Lindbergh flew from New York all the way to, um, to Paris and it was really difficult. It was really difficult for him. And he went through a lot, but he made it and he was very famous and it changed air, um, air travel forever. I'm gonna go back and reread a section. A telephone wire stretches across the far end of the field. To touch this wire will plunge the plane to the ground. There is an extra fuel tank in front of the cockpit. Because of this, Lindbergh cannot see straight ahead. Will the spirit of St. Louis with its over 5,000 pounds rise into the air? To keep the plane lighter, Lindbergh is leaving behind his radio and parachute. Will that be enough? He has been up all night getting ready. A thought runs back and forth through his mind. It is still possible to turn back, to return home, and yet another thought is stronger. I have been waiting my entire life for this flight. What do you think Charles is feeling at this moment in, the, in this book? What in the book makes you think that?
Well, Pippi, I think that Charles is probably feeling really excited and nervous and doesn't want to give up on his dream. Um, and my evidence for this is that he says, I have been waiting my entire life for this flight. Your entire life is a long time if you've been waiting for something. So I think that he's um, feeling really excited and nervous and doesn't want to give up on his dream. And that was the story flight, the journey of Charles Lindbergh. So I'm going to talk about individual, your individualized daily reading, IDR. Um, for this week and over the next several weeks, you're going to be reading fiction and narrative nonfiction books. The book Flight is an example of narrative nonfiction. It tells us true events through an interesting story. And remember the word narrative means story. So as you're um, picking your books this week, I want you to be picking either fiction or non narrative nonfiction. And we're going to be practicing some fix-up strategies. As readers are reading, they should be noticing whether or not they are understanding the text. And if they are confused or they don't understand a word, they should be practicing some fix-up strategies. So one fix-up strategy I want my fourth graders to work on is practicing rereading. And the other fix-up strategy is reading ahead. So I have a fiction book here, Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. I'm going to um, read the first page and show how I can use rereading re and reading ahead to help me better understand the text. So this is a book that I have read to many fourth grade classes throughout the years. Um, and so if you're interested, I definitely recommend Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. It's a great classic story. Mrs. Frisbee, the head of a family of field mice, lived in an underground house in the vegetable garden of a farmer named Mr. Fitzgibbon. It was a winter house, such as some field mice move to when food becomes too scarce. Hmm, that word scarce, I don't know what that means. It was a winter house, such as some field mice move to when food becomes too scarce. So I think maybe it has to do with food. And the living too hard in the woods and pastures. In the soft earth of a bean, potato, black-eyed pea, and asparagus patch, there is plenty of food left over for mice after the human crop has been gathered. Okay, after rereading and reading ahead, I think the word scarce means um, when there isn't a lot of food. And so they moved to the place in the garden where there is a lot of food um, because they said when food becomes scarce and then there is plenty of food left over. Um, so if there's plenty of food in one place and it's scarce in another, that must mean not enough. So that is how you can practice using rereading and reading on to help you better understand your text. If a reader is finding that rereading and reading ahead are still not helping, I would like to recommend some other reading strategies. So I'm going to include a poster after this with some other reading strategies that you can try to help you better understand your text. All right, thank you so much, fourth graders, for letting me read to you today. I'll be looking forward to reading with you more tomorrow.